Uh, thanks for coming today. Um, my name is Micah Utrecht. Um, you know, a couple people in the crowd here. I was a, a student of Megan Burke, so you probably you know uh, at Loyola. Loyola have been like four years ago. Um, and um, I am uh, a writer uh, in Chicago, I guess, a soon to be full time writer mostly on labor issues, and I've sort of stumbled into um, writing about labor and education issues and teachers unions in general. Uh, and I'm not, I, I say that to, to emphasize that I'm not, uh, I'm not a teacher, right? I don't know, I have no clue what it's like to be in front of a, a, a classroom full of children every day for seven hours, and so I feel like it's funny because I don't really feel like much of an expert on that kind of thing. There's probably people around the circle who have much more of an expertise uh, in that than, than I do. But I am interested um, particularly in um, uh, teachers' unionism and uh, education reform, because obviously, uh, especially folks who are in, in who are going to be teachers soon know that uh, education reform is a big thing that is uh, talked about sort of a, a battle over what that education reform uh, will look like and who are the people who are pushing that education reform, and, um, which, I'll, which I'll get into in a second. But I say all this to say um, that uh, at A, that I'm, I am not any kind of expert on education, um, and I'm not certainly not neutral on anything like this. I'm the son of a teacher's union member of the, uh, my mom is a member of the National Education Association in Michigan, paraprofessional, that's one of the the NEA is one of the two National Teachers Unions, American Federation of Teachers, and the NEA. Um, and uh, I worked in labor uh, since I was an undergrad, um, first in a group called United Students Against Sweatshops, and then I've worked uh, for different unions and uh, labor organizations since I graduated. So um, I, I put my bias up front. I am no sort of, I am a partisan for, uh, for the labor movement, for unions. I think they're really important, which I can. I'll, I'll give it to in the talk, but I just say that to just sort of get that out there. That I'm, not, I'm no, I'm no neutral observer. Of this stuff. Um, so education is of interest to me again as an outsider for uh, several reasons, and I think the principal one is that I think the education system, particularly in an urban area like Chicago where I live, is a place where all of the uh, a lot of the different forms of inequality uh, and uh, you know, uh, on class or on gender or on race all sort of come together uh, in stark stark contrast. Um, you know, you see racial inequality very vividly uh, in the Chicago school system, the class inequality. Um, in, among teachers you see a lot of the issues around gender and work. Um, and sort of devaluing of, of uh, what is what is always uh, traditionally been in the U.S. women's work and teaching. Um, you see all of this sort of come together under one building, under a school, and it and it you know, just, you know children are the ones who uh, it's played out like not not adults. So you know children are the, uh, the the vehicle through which you see these these inequalities. So that's the the main reason why it's something that's so uh, important to me to examine because you see a lot of these larger issues in society um, all coming together under one roof. Um, and you also see that all those things coming together in what has come to be uh, known as education reform, um, which, you know, over the last decade, decade and a half or so, has something been something that uh, lots of folks have been sort of beating the drum about, about the need to uh, reform American public schools, in particular urban public schools in America. Um, and, you know, before I even get into what the specifics of that are, I think education reform is usually talked about as if it's its own sort of independent phenomenon, uh, something that, um, that isn't connected at all to larger shifts in the economy, um, uh, you know, larger changes in uh, the relationship between bosses and workers, uh, large changes about what's happening in the public sector. Um, it's usually framed as 
there is a crisis in America on public education, you have to do something about it without you know, sort of acknowledging that the kinds of fixes that have been proposed for education reform are the same kind of fixes that we've seen in large part uh, proposed for the American workforce as a whole. Um, and so, you know, the, the name for uh, that kind of ideological uh, thought around what changes in the broader economy uh, should look like, you know, is uh, neoliberalism or, you know, the ascendance of uh, uh, hyper free market, hyper capitalism um, that has been seen at least since Ronald Reagan in the 80s, not before that. Um, and, you know, as I said, the ideas that have come to dominate education reform are very similar to those ideas that uh, dominate, that are part of the sort of neoliberal consensus uh, as a whole. So the neoliberal era, uh, sort of this era of the extreme of free market capitalism, started in earnest in the early 1980s, you know, led by people like Ronald Reagan, um, Margaret Thatcher in the UK, who just died last week, um, among other world leaders. And it's a sort of a, you know, a word that it feels sort of neoliberalism, what does that really mean? Liberalism, is it related to like, you know, the, the left wing, like what, what does it really mean? So um, I have a definition here from somebody, uh, uh, academic David Harvey, who wrote a book that's a short, a brief history of neoliberalism. It's the theory of economic practices that proposes that human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trade. And the role of the state is to create and preserve an institutional framework appropriate to such practices. So in sort of less jargon, um, it means that you know, neoliberalism sees the free market as the best way to make life better for all people, right? Um, so if the free market, more free market means better lives for more people, what we need is to expand the market more and more into everybody's lives. Um, and then the role of government, is, is in the second part of that quote, um, under neoliberalism, is to push that expansion of the free market to, to help facilitate it, uh, its expansion into um, areas perhaps where the market wasn't always present in the past. Um, so what that means, sort of in less theoretical terms, is uh, you know, since the 1980s, uh, there's been an effort to try to destroy unions in the US. Uh, membership in unions in this country has been on a sort of steady decline since the 1970s uh, to the point where we now have, I think the total number is uh, there's less than 7% of American workers who are in the private sector who are in unions. I think it's a little less than 12% overall who are both public and private sector employees who are in unions. And it's just a number that's sort of steadily declining every year we hear uh, the new numbers about how labor movement has lost more and more um, members. Um, we're at the lowest in the number, and the lowest amount of people now since the Great Depression in unions. Um, and there's an attack on unions because unions are the principal body through which workers can defend their rights in society. Um, Workers who have unions across the board have you know, their health care, their pay, um, you know, processes for uh, being fired. Um, they can't just be at the whim of the boss if the boss doesn't like your color of your shirt one day or, or you know, wants to discriminate against you because you're, for any reason, a woman or whatever. There, there are sort of fixed uh, uh, processes by which uh, you are protected as a worker that you don't have in this country if you don't have a union. And that is obviously a big impediment to corporations, uh, companies being able to make money because they don't want to pay people more money. They don't want to give people better health care benefits. They want to have total control over the workplace in order to shape it to whatever can make them the most money. Right? That's how the free market works. Um, and so uh, we've lost all these union members uh, since the 1980s. That there's been huge expansion of inequality in the US. Um, which is also at the worst level it's been since the Great Depression. Um, folks probably heard a lot about that around 2011 when the Occupy movement was happening, talking about the 1% getting huge amounts of the uh, benefits of, uh, of the economy 
um, hugely expanding inequality un under the one percent. One percent gets more and more. One percent richest people in the country have more and more wealth, while the vast majority of the country suffers. And it's been the same story in countries all over uh, the world who have instituted these same kinds of policies. I don't know if anyone saw it during uh, Margaret Thatcher's funeral in the UK, which was I think uh, two days ago or yesterday. I mean, there were people who were gathered to mourn, but there were also thousands of people who were on the streets, like booing the casket as it went by. Uh, and you know, having parties in the streets because uh, of Margaret Thatcher's death. Uh, that's because, in large part, uh, you know, a lot of people's lives in the UK were greatly worsened uh, under the neoliberal era. And it's the same in, in country after country. Um, so, uh, the other, other thing that's happened under the neoliberal era is that um, since workers don't have unions and don't have a way to sort of uh, have a body that can fight for their rights on the job and what their what their conditions on the job are going to be like. Um, that bosses force them to do more and more work um, for you know at, maybe at a faster pace or extra responsibilities um, for you know the same or even less uh, pay than they've had in the past. Um, one of the main things that's meant that's relevant to this discussion is the this privatization. Uh, selling off of uh, two corporations of public goods. Um, so does anyone, I know we're not in Chicago, but uh, did some folks in Bloomington hear about the parking meter deal that, that happened in, in Chicago recently, a few years ago, I guess it is, that the city used to, uh, it sounds like an inane example, but I think it's actually a really good one because, you know, uh, the city used to run all the parking meters in Chicago, and so when you put in your quarters for the parking meter, that corridor would then go back to the city to, uh, you know, build a road or uh, purify the water or pay for the, you know, an annual like free Jay Z concert like at the at the, uh, you know, whatever like whatever the city does like that, you know, the city takes that money and, and provides goods to its services, whether essential things like water purification or things like you know, Jay Z. Um, but the city privatized the parking meters, which turned it over to a, a for-profit corporation. So the, the rates immediately shot up. Um, and now when you pay $7 an hour to park in downtown Chicago, you're not paying for the Jay-Z council anymore. You're paying for the, some of the CEOs uh, and the executives sort of uh, pockets to get it um, So that's, that's one example. There's many things in Chicago and other cities privatized sold off that were overseen by the government but were given over to the, the private sector. Um, also the chipping away of government services like everything uh, from you know, erosion of uh, food stamps, uh, you know, like services given to, to citizens like food stamps or welfare or things like the postal service um, or police officers and firefighters, you know, those are things that are paid for by the uh, public sector, by the government. Um, and as budgets have gotten tighter, there's been a large push for you know, less services from people like the police officers and firefighters, or the current fight is you know, no Saturday service for the American US Postal Service, things like that. Um, so these are the sort of a couple of the broad trends that are in the American economy uh, today in the 21st century. And you know, I list all of those things out because, again, those kinds of uh, changes that have been happening in the American economy are in large part a lot of the same things that have been seen in education reform um, during you know, sort of the late 90s and 2000s up to now. Um, and so we usually assume that those the decisions that are made about what education reform look like, looks like, well, it's because somebody thinks that children are, you know, American public school children are getting the short end of the stick uh, and we need to change the system uh, in order to ensure that they, um, that they can have a better future in their education. Um, when really, a lot of these changes that are suggested are sort of uh, in the same vein as these other things that have worked to expand inequality and to erode services for people who need them and, and stuff like that. So I think it's important, it's important to sort of keep those broad changes in mind whenever the, there's this discussion about um, what American education reform looks like. So, in terms of specifically education reform, during the, the neoliberal 
free market reform era, um, much like the whole list of things I just gave about the changes in the broader economy, uh, in uh, education we've seen maybe first and foremost an attack on teachers' unions. The teachers' unions are to blame for all of the ills of public education in, in America. Has anyone ever seen the movie uh, Waiting for Superman, the big documentary that came out a few years ago? Whenever the, the head of the American Federation of Teachers, President Randy Weingarten, comes on in that movie, it's like, it's like the evil music like it starts around her because she is the, the one who is holding back uh, America's uh, school children from, from learning. That's, that's the idea. That the teachers unions uh, defend the interests of themselves and themselves only and don't really care what happened to uh, public school children. That's, that's the idea. And so uh, that's, been, that's been why there have been such strong attacks on um, you know, the, there's this idea that poverty of the students doesn't matter, that it shouldn't matter in terms of how they are taught. Um, you know, teachers unions have, over the years, frequently talked about poverty of students as to why you know, the, the, uh, public schools are in such sad shape in you know, urban areas. Well, a lot of it has to do with the poverty of the students. Um, if you listen to people like Michelle Reed, who's a big education reformer talk, or anybody in this uh, Waiting for Superman movie, or the head of Teach for America, Wendy Cobb, when, when inequality is brought up, poverty is brought up with students, the response is always, you know, poverty doesn't matter. That what matters is the, uh, whether or not the teacher in front of the classroom is willing to work hard enough um, to uh, teach the, the ch these children um, and whatever conditions that are happening outside of the classroom um, don't matter. And so, you know, that kind of statement, they wouldn't say this outright, but clearly education reform uh, is seen as something that happens independently of any other kinds of changes, uh, like fighting for better wages for public school children's parents, for example, or, you know, ensuring that we have a, like a public health care system. Uh, in this country, so poor urban public school students can make sure that they go, you know, get their illnesses taken care of if their uh, parents don't have enough money to um, afford health insurance. Um, those things are always sort of left aside. All that matters is uh, the teacher's willingness uh, to just work really, really hard and uh, make up for whatever problems the student has outside. Um, you know, things like class size don't matter, that you can have a class full of 45 elementary school students. If you have a good teacher there, they can, they can deal with it, and that'll be, you know, they'll, they'll be able to deliver. Um, the future teachers of Chicago are shaking their heads at this over here. Um, but, that, but that's the idea. That they, they'll say that explicitly, so class size doesn't matter, which is sort of, uh, you know, kind of like you know, uh, the push for what American workers as a whole are expected to do, right? That they're expected to produce more uh, and that they just need to sort of put head down and, and do it. And, um, and in the case of education, you should be able to throw as many students as you as possible um, and you should be able to handle it if you're if you're a good teacher. If you're a teacher who deserves to actually be in a classroom. Um, that education should not be overseen uh, by the public. That it not, should not be a public good. That private corporations um, should be the ones that are running public education, or that should be running, I guess, education as a whole. Um, that they can do a better job of educating children than, than the government can. Um, so, you know, private companies who, you know, if you're a private company, again, your goal is to make money, um, and you have to sort of answer to the bottom line. Eventually, um, the idea is that 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 is a better the business model, the free market model, uh, is a way uh, that will better serve America's school children than not having the profit mode present. Um, there's the idea that teaching doesn't need to be sort of professionalized. That um, if you uh, read a lot of accounts, sort of sympathetic accounts of teacher uh, of education reform. You hear people saying that uh, 
it's a waste of time that anyone, that people go to school to study education. Um, you know, the Teach for America model, for example, is that you have a couple of weeks of, of learning the basics of um, how to teach kids and then you just throw them in front of a classroom. But, but Teach for America, you know, takes a lot of sort of Ivy League level, people who come from very elite backgrounds. And so the idea is that you need these people who are the best and the brightest. Um, if, if you pick the, the very smartest people from the, the most elite schools um, to go teach, they'll be able to handle anything you throw at them extensively because they're, they are the smartest, the elite, cream of the problem in society, right? Um, and then after they do the two years of Teach for America, they can then go on to law school or work on Wall Street or whatever it is, which is how the, that program has become to be seen by a lot of people. People from elite schools go there, and it looks great on their resume for when they apply to law school or whatever. Um, so, so for Teach for America specifically, it's like, Teaching becomes this sort of two-year thing that you do to sort of give back to the kids, uh, and, and then you just rather than teaching being a career that people are dedicated to for their entire lives. Um, there's the obsession of standardized testing, right? Probably folks have heard a lot about this lately. Um, that if you are going to, um, you know, in, in the free market, for example, private companies that you know, managers. And, CEOs are constantly looking at a stream of data to analyze what kind of output they're getting from their workers, right? And so there's a similar idea with students, that if you test and test and test with students with standardized tests, you can find out whether or not the teachers have been doing a good job uh, teaching these students. The, the, and that uh, one of the things that's more, most sort of jarring to me is that democracy is an actual barrier to instituting this kind of reform. Um, in Chicago, for example, um, the school board and the CEO of Chicago Public Schools are not elected by the citizens of Chicago. Um, they are appointed by the mayor. Uh, the same thing is true in New York City. Um, I believe the mayor of Los Angeles is pushing for it there. And folks will say very explicitly, if you have these democratic measures uh, in, in the school system, if, people are allowed to vote for who's going to be on the school board or whatever, uh, we're not going to be able to accomplish the kind of reforms that we need to accomplish. So there's this kind of open uh, hatred and distrust of democracy that uh, to me is a very jarring thing in a country that supposedly prides itself on being highly democratic. Um, and so the people who you know, push these reforms are the, are the same people who have benefited from the larger you know, um, in American society. I mean, school reform has become this kind of pet cause for a lot of really, really wealthy people. Um, you know, the three foundations that are pushing it the strongest uh, in the U.S. are uh, the Broad Foundation, the, uh, which is Broad, uh, Eli Broad was, um, he headed up a, a mortgage company that he eventually became a billionaire, and he founded this foundation that became one of the most important foundations in pushing uh, the Gates Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates, by far the biggest uh, foundation that will put money towards these kinds of things to so make these kinds of reforms happen. And the Walton Foundation, which is owned by the Walton family of the uh, Walmart family. Right? So these are uh, people who have become extremely wealthy during the neoliberal era. Um, but we're sort of supposed to think that uh, they've made their money, they want to give back by sort of giving it all to the children. Um, it's all for the children. Uh, but you see them sort of trying to remake the public education system in the, uh, in the you know, much like they would run their own company, right, to, to make money and to sort of get lots of output, quantifiable output. Um, and then, you know, folks on Wall Street, um, hedge fund managers, other millionaire and billionaire folks on, on Wall Street um, have sort of made it into this charity of choice. There's this quote from uh, this book, Class Warfare, that's about, uh, came out two years ago, it's about um, sort of education reform fights generally. Um, and it's about this organization, Democrats for Education Reform, which is trying to push the Democratic Party to accept um, and get behind more of these kinds of uh, reforms. And the quote says that the, the deeper Democrats for Education Reform plan uh, for the millions in donations that they've received 
uh, was right out of the playbook of former George W. Bush political guru Karl Rove and other conservative political activists. They're going to put the millions in uh, the millions into a type of political action fund called 501c4 that did not have to reveal its donors. That way, the unions couldn't attack their campaign as a plot by Wall Street billionaires to take over the public schools. Uh, so there's a sort of very open admittance that uh, people who are extremely wealthy um, are trying to hide the fact that they are the ones who are pushing education reform because they know if people knew where the money was coming from and was pushing for these kinds of reforms, they might be a little uh, suspect of the motives of the people that were pushing. Um, so that's sort of uh, a lot of the, of the background of it. Um, and um, in terms of what those reforms have looked like around the U.S., um, if you look at around the U.S., Chicago is actually a good example because Chicago is one of the primary cities where these reforms have been uh, instituted. Um, uh, you can see that uh, it has not been, it has not produced a great results for um, Chicago's school children uh, and for school children around, around the country. Um, you know, one of the, you know, to take Chicago as an example, um, charter schools have been a, a particularly, uh, one of, the, one of the, the biggest ways that they've pushed these kinds of education reforms in Chicago because charter schools are schools that, um, you know, get money from the public. Uh, almost, I think this is the number is like 90 or 99 percent of their funding comes from pub the public, from the government, in the same way that a traditional public school would run. But they don't have to uh, obey a lot of rules that a traditional public school has to obey. And that one of that one of those rules they don't have to obey, for example, is that teachers don't have the union in charter schools. Um, and Chicago has 110 charter schools. Uh, the Gates Foundation uh, has this Chicago sign on this plan for the Gates Foundation that would um, open up 60 new charter schools in Chicago by 2017, and those schools will be opening at the same time that CPS is closing on the schools, which maybe folks have heard about, which I'll talk more about in a second. Um, but you know, in terms of uh, how students in those schools have performed, um, you know, you can look at, you know, charter schools do a lot of standardized testing, right? So even if you don't think that standardized testing is the best way to gauge how well students are doing, you can look at there. There, there, are, there are lots of studies that look at uh, what kind of uh, standardized test scores students from charter schools have produced, right? Uh, and there's lots of competing studies that uh, argue that the, the numbers, uh, argue about what the performance of students in charter schools look like. Um, that's part of the result of having people like billionaires in your, in your corners that you can fund your own studies to, uh, to examine um, whether or not your reforms have been successful and lo and behold, the study that you paid for found that your school is doing great, right? Um, but uh, the there's uh, the largest study that's been done on charter school performance came out of Stanford University's education school um, and it found that overall around the country charter schools aren't outperforming um, traditional public schools nationally. Um, and the U.S. Department of Education released a study in 2010 that found the same thing among uh, middle schools. Uh, you know, there was a, another study that the Department of Education did every year from 2003, 2005, 2007, 2009, found the same thing every year. Um, so even on this m the metric that charter schools claim to care about the most, right, these standardized test scores, and they spend lots of time teaching students to be able to uh, perform well on standardized tests, uh, they don't outperform the most traditional. Teachers union membership nationally is way down, because, especially in Chicago, because there are all of these charter schools opening up at the same time as traditional public schools are closing. Um, one thing that I read about recently is that when a charter school uh, opens up in a neighborhood, like if a, na a neighborhood school closes and the charter school takes its, its place, the student body that then comes back to that charter school will, looks much different than the uh, student body that was there in the traditional public school. Uh, students, because the charter schools get to choose, right, who uh, is in their classroom, right? They can, uh, rather than just taking any student who lives in the neighborhood, like most neighborhood public schools do, they can turn people down. And so, uh, in, in Chicago, for example, um, 
charter schools, uh, the numbers are that 15.8% uh, of students in all of CPS uh, as a whole are uh, English as a second language learners, but only 8% in charter schools are English as a second language learners. Uh, there's uh, sort of similar numbers in terms of like uh, student, special ed students. Uh, CPS has a large percentage or a decent percentage of special ed students. Far, far fewer special ed students um, in charter schools in Chicago. And that's because charter schools can look at these students and say, well, you know, so from a business point of view, right, from a private corporation's point of view, they say, well, I have this special ed student in my classroom. I'm going to have to invest lots of resources into them. They're going to require a smaller class size. They're going to require all kinds of resources that the other students uh, wouldn't, wouldn't require. So maybe I should accept them uh, into my school. I heard a story from a special ed teacher in Chicago last week. Um, had a student who heard the school closed. She tried to get them into a, another charter school that was in the neighborhood. And when she called them up, they said, oh yeah, we've got plenty of space. But then once she actually put in the application, and had to write in the application that the student was a special ed student with pretty severe special ed needs. It, all of a sudden, oh, actually, we don't have any room in the school right now. Um, and so that's a common story that I've heard from, uh, from multiple teachers who are dealing with special ed students. The numbers show that too, that the charter schools don't accept those kinds of uh, students with special needs in the same way. Um, in Chicago, there's this idea, you know, charter schools have opened up, especially in low-income areas, and sort of when they open up, they have a lot of money uh, and can pull students uh, from the traditional public school and try to get them to come to this charter school. Um, so they'll you know, go door to door knocking about how great this charter school is. Um, you should send your student, your, your child here, um, and can sort of suck students from the traditional neighborhood public schools. And then several years later, the school is, uh, is underutilized. There are, there are not enough students occupying the classroom at that school, and so we need to close the school, um, which is a big fight that's happening in Chicago right now. Um, well, part of the reason that a lot of these schools are underutilized is because charter schools are taking the students uh, from the church and public school uh, and encouraging them to come to the charter school. Um, and so in general, there's been uh, you know, class size expansion. Um, and, and this idea that I think is maybe the, the key thing is the expansion of the, of the sort of uh, mindset of the private sector into um, public schools. That there are people in, uh, in who are now making lots of money um, based on uh, this, this push for privatization. So you know, uh, standardized testing, for example. There are there are schools, uh, there are uh, corporations who run, who, you know, administer standardized tests uh, and have people to grade them. Also. So they are getting you know, huge amounts of money uh, in contracts with uh, schools who are obsessed with private, with uh, with standardized testing. Um, I think half of charter operators around the, the country are for profit. Um, so these are operators who get money from the government, um, the same amount of money that you would get, uh, often the same amount of money that you would get um, per student, uh, that a public school would get per student, right? Um, but they're actually for profit corporations um, whose goal is to make a profit. Um, and even in, in Nonprofits, there's sort of a, charters seem to lend themselves to an idea of uh, corruption happening. I mean, in Chicago, there's this major charter operator, Uno, um, that's one of the most powerful, politically powerful charter networks in the city. And there was just this huge story about there's a sort of old school Chicago style patronage, sort of handing out you know contracts to the CEO's brother or his uncle or his wife's friend, you know, millions of dollars. It's all coming from taxpayers you know, pockets that is given out in sort of old school corruption model. So um, and there's you know other stuff we mentioned before, it's sort of lack of democracy, um, all that all that kind of stuff is happening in, in Chicago, which as I said is one of the most you know, one of the central places in the country where you see this model sort of being tested out. So we've got less democracy. Uh, teachers are making less money. I think teachers in Chicago make twenty thousand dollars on average less at a charter school than they do uh, at a traditional public school, according to the CPS numbers. And then like seventy thousand is the median salary for 70, seventy-seven thousand 
salary for a traditional public school teacher. It's like fifty some thousand for a, a charter. Um, you know, so these are the, that's the kind of thing that you see in Chicago. Um, the expansion of this, this model um, and. Overall, there's this idea, and this is sort of where the, the discussion about the Chicago teacher comes in. There's this idea, uh, there's, there's this loss in the idea of what public education is actually supposed to be all about. Um, you know, the idea, the supposed idea behind public education is it's supposed to be this kind of equalizer for all people, right? That uh, you're supposed to be dedicated to educating all students, no matter what their uh, needs are or what their race is or what their, um, you know, their class background like and, and of course that hasn't played out in practice we do have these massive inequalities but that's supposed, supposedly the idea that is undergirding the entire public education system um, but you have charter schools some of which were you know obeying the profit motive uh, you know, the thing that it's okay to uh, dump kids that they don't think that it will make it or that that will require an extra investment of resources. Um, kids with behavior problems or kids who speak English and second language, all that stuff. Um, so, you know, there's a, a, sh a shift in the idea of what, what even undergirds uh, public education, that we're losing this idea that it's supposed to be something for everyone, uh, that all students are supposed to be able to enjoy the same opportunities. Um, and so, you know, this is the that these are some of the things that become sort of the mainstream consensus in education reform. Um, it's been sort of endorsed wholeheartedly by both parties. I mean, um, you know, they're talking about the Democrats for Education Reform, this group that's trying to push the Democratic Party to uh, accept lots of these kinds of reforms. Obviously, in Chicago, Rahm Emanuel is a Democrat. He's one of the principal people who is pushing this kind of agenda. Um, President Obama has been on board with this kind of stuff since before he was even a senator. He's um, always push for these kinds of uh, education reforms. You can see it in his Race to the Top program, which is uh, you know, based on a lot of these assumptions about education. It's also based on a similar program that was done in Chicago, um, Renaissance 2010. So he's, he's, you know, the, the Democratic Party as a whole really buys into this idea that this is the kind of reform that we need uh, in education. Um, and so it, this is a really uh, highly damaging agenda for teachers, for students, and for all communities, um, especially in, in urban areas. Um, and then it's one that uh, should be fought, in my opinion. Um, but the question is, how should it be fought? Um, well, the one group that really is big enough to take on the agenda, uh, to take up this agenda on, to really push back against this kind of reform are teachers unions. Teachers unions are the only people who have the resources, who have the sort of organizational capacity, who have the mass membership, um, the sort of discipline as an organization uh, to really be able to push back on this kind of stuff. Which is why, of course, education reformers want to get rid of them is because they know this, that they, they know that teachers unions have the potential to be this kind of body that can push back uh, against this kind of just like in the larger economy, unions are the way uh, that workers can really fight for their rights on the job, and fight for the fight against the agenda of their bosses. Uh, teachers' unions are, are the way that, that can be done uh, in education, and so they they need to be destroyed or at least weakened um, and uh, brought on board to that agenda of, of uh, supporting this kind of education. Um, and in Chicago, in Chicago, the Chicago Teachers Union uh, was one of the earliest, was the earliest city where there was teachers who got together to organize um, around their conditions at work and who eventually formed a union. Um, there were a bunch of unions, there used to be several unions in Chicago. They all formed the CTU, I think, in the 30s. Um, and, you know, they were fighting against issues like extremely low pay. Um, there was this really sexist ideas about, you know, teach, uh, you know, well, if, if the woman is working, uh, then um, it must be just supplemental income to her, her husband, who is the one who's actually making money uh, for the family, so we don't even pay them very much. Um, you know, uh, total lack of control over what 
reform in the schools look like. Reform has always been something ever since the early 1900s. People are beating the drum of, of, ref, of education reform, and, and uh, the, the teachers are usually not the ones who, uh, uh, despite being the ones who are in the classroom every day, who are, you know, live the education system firsthand. They're not the ones who are turned to what those, uh, for what uh, those reforms should look like, right? Um, and so, you know, in the 30s, uh, you know, there's a very fascinating history of, of the Chicago Teachers Union. If you all are going to teach in Chicago, it might be interesting to uh, read about. Um, you know, in the 30s, for example, teachers uh, hadn't been paid during the Great Depression for months on end. They were way behind in receiving their paychecks. And, uh, and there, there were teachers within the union uh, who were sort of agitating, trying to get their union to do something about it. Uh, the union wouldn't do much about it. Um, and so the independently organized groups of teachers, uh, there was one, uh, the real famous one, was led by this guy John Fuchs, who became president of the union later. But uh, he was a phys ed teacher, a high school phys ed teacher. He led uh, groups of teachers in this mass rally in downtown Chicago, uh, where they, they were attacked by uh, police on horses, and they brought textbooks that they threw at the police on these horses. And these like really crazy, like you wouldn't think about public school teachers throwing textbooks at police on horses. But this is the sort of, the sort of tradition uh, in, in places like Chicago and other urban areas that, uh, you know, the, the really like, pitch battle on the streets around teachers' issues. They eventually uh, were paid after like, leaving these kind of similar fights for a long time. In the 60s and 70s in Chicago, the civil rights movement uh, focused a lot around education and how unequal the schools were. Um, and the teachers' union was not on board a lot of those kinds of reforms, and so there are again independent groups within the union uh, who were trying to push the union to take on racial justice as uh, as a, a topic. Um, you know, in Chicago in the 60s and 70s, there was uh, this thing called full-time basis substitutes, which, uh, despite the fact that there was a growing population of African American students in the school system, African American teachers were locked into the system of being, being a, a full-time basis substitute. Um, and couldn't um, ever make it to being a full teacher and you know, the sort of pay and, and uh, you know, honor and all that, that, that goes along with that. And so um, there had to be independent efforts within the union uh, to make people care about those things and, 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 and as well as get on board with what was happening with the broader civil rights movement. Um, and that actually, uh, you know, those fights, those racial justice fights in the union, uh, led to, uh, in the 70s, the creation of what was called the United Progressive Caucus. Um, good sort of democratic open unions have uh, ways to you know, sort of duke it out within their membership, duke it out in sort of positive sort of democratic sense of uh, you know, running different uh, slates of candidates to, you know, for leadership in the union, membership votes on them, right? Um, Sort of like many political parties within the union themselves, uh, and this this caucus, the United Progressive Caucus, which came out of these racial justice fights, uh, was formed uh, in the 1970s. And sort of the short history is that they started as a really a progressive leadership that was fighting for racial justice issues. But by the time that the 2000s, uh, 90s, and 2000s rolled around, um, they had become, I think, um, what sort of like a, what, what uh, a lot of people want you to think of unions, sort of top, very top heavy, people at the top paying themselves lots of money, not really fighting for their members, um, you know, sort of a, a not, not doing much for their membership despite whatever attacks are happening on their, on their members. Um, you know, in the 2000s there were all kinds of school closings that were starting to happen in Chicago, again around closing public schools and opening up charter schools in, in their way, uh, and the union leadership wasn't doing anything around it. So the union, uh, some people in the union were very angry about the fact that they were losing their jobs uh, and that the union wasn't doing much about it, started this caucus, uh, the Caucus of Rank and File Educators for to uh, eventually, at first, it just sort of try to push the union uh, to act, and it eventually turned into um, a slate of people that, that ran for the leadership of the union to take control. Um, 
And you know, one teacher when I was interviewing him told me that uh, the way he would characterize the the old leadership in the, during the 2000s, they would say that you know you're tempted to say that they were asleep at the wheel um, of the wheel being the union, thing. but they actually weren't asleep. They were joyriding. That they were. You know, despite the fact that there were all kinds of attacks on the union, the, the schools were closing, all this stuff was happening, um, they were paying themselves massive amounts of money and not really doing anything for their membership. Um, so this group core uh, started uh, you know, organizing, and because the union has this sort of vibrant democratic uh, tradition, they led a traditional campaign in their union and um, won in 2010. And so. I tell this story because I think a lot of people, um, even people who are sympathetic to the union, see the Chicago Teachers Union and think, oh wow, that's, that's crazy what they're doing there in Chicago. I wish, you know, for example, uh, my mom was a teacher union member, would say, I wish uh, you know, my union was like that, without realizing that it was actually just a group of teachers who were you know, in the classroom uh, for decades who just became very angry at what their union was doing or was not doing. Um, and decided to run the slate and take over the union. Um, and I think it's important to tell that history because a lot of people think of unions as all, unions in general, teachers unions in particular, as being one way, right? Um, without realizing that there are sort of, there's a contestation within unions about what that union is going to look like. Um, that there is, you know, a lot of people describe it as Business unionism versus social movement unionism. There are uh, people who, uh, that there's a way of doing the labor movement, um, sort of business as usual, where you sort of don't uh, start, uh, you don't want to push too many people's buttons, you don't want to rock the boat, you just sort of uh, can pay yourself lots of money and just uh, not really do much to fight for what people, um, what your members' needs are. And which certainly wouldn't make any kind of ties to broader communities. Um, to uh, fight for something beyond just like pay and benefits, right? The, the, the main focus of the union is to fight for better pay and benefits for the members. Versus this kind of social movement unionism, which is what you now see in the Chicago Teachers Union, where the union is about far more than just a, a good benefits and, and better pay, but it's about a larger agenda of, of social justice. It's about fighting uh, racism and racial inequalities in Chicago public schools. Uh, it's about you know, maintaining education as a public good that's not handed over to um, you know, private corporations to do with as they please. Um, so I think it's important to, to remember that to, when <laughs> folks sort of speak about unions as being one way, that there are, there are multiple ways of doing unionism. And uh, in Chicago, you can see the sort of fight within a union for what that union is going to look like. Um, so once the union took over in, in 2010, lots of things changed very quickly. Uh, there was membership involvement in a way that had never been done before. And previously, it was just sort of the leadership that was in charge of things. And then maybe, uh, I, I, know, I remember people would tell me when I interviewed them that they didn't know who the president was. They had never, they, they couldn't remember their name. They just knew that once in a while they had to check in to see you know, what their, uh, uh, if they'd be getting a raise for the next contract or, or something like that. But, but certainly the union was not seen as uh, the way by which they were going to, to really fight. Or even something they had to be very involved with. They just sort of paid their, their dues to the union once a month and, and that was the extent of their involvement. So this core comes in and really engages new levels of, uh, of the membership. Um, gets people involved in all kinds of uh, different things. They have the summer internship program where the union goes out and is knocking on people's doors, uh, people who are parents of uh, Chicago Public School students, and asking them sort of what, what they want uh, education, you know, what they want the children's education to look like. Um, a real engagement with organized groups and communities uh, in these neighborhoods, especially where there are things like school closings happening. So majority African American and Latino neighborhoods where uh, community groups have been fighting uh, you know, the, this kind of education reform for a long time. They've been fighting school closures and all that stuff. The union, with this new leadership, 
gets in, it becomes a close partner with these uh, community groups. So again, expanding what uh, their concern is as a union to be not just about what are called bread and butter issues, but about the wider social justice agenda that's happening in the city. Um, there's these new levels of, of democracy that folks just are not used to in their in their union. Um, again, you know, the woman who didn't even know uh, the president of the union's name, um, and that woman in particular who I interviewed became a very active, uh, took an active leadership role on the union um, expansion of, uh, general expansion of members being in control of the union. And one of the most important things uh, that I think, and it became sort of central to what eventually became uh, the strike, is that this is a union that actually put forward a vision of what education reform um, should look like. Uh, unions in the past, teachers unions in the past, are frequently you know, characterized by these um, the neoliberal reformers as being sort of bodies that are blocking education reform. And, and maybe you know, if teachers unions spoke up about what neoliberal education reform looked like, they might say, you know, this is bad. Like we don't, we don't want this for our students. This is not beneficial to them. But they would not put forward. Often, wouldn't put forward their own vision for what that reform should look like. The, the Chicago teachers union under this new leadership um, really did that. Um, they put out this document that became a sort of central. Their sort of central document that explained their vision for how schools actually should look. Um, that I think it laid out sort of in very stark terms like what Chicago's, what the CPS system looked like and what it should look like. Um, you know, 91 percent of the, uh, the students in Chicago public schools are students of color. Over 80 percent qualify for free or reduced lunches, you know, extreme poverty throughout the system. Um, and it should be noted that like Chicago is not 91 percent color, right? Chicago is something like uh, 40, 35, 40 percent white. So all of, but all of those white students who live, you know, school age students who live in Chicago are being sent to public school, or, uh, to private schools um, because you know, parents, for whatever reason, the schools are in rough shape or the parents are racist and don't put their children with, uh, with uh, students of color. Whatever reason, that 91 percent of the, of the school uh, students of color. Um, there's large amounts of, of trauma and exposure to violence. I don't know if anyone heard the This American Life episode that was uh, a few weeks ago about this high school in, um, in Chicago, Harper High School, that really puts a lot of the issues of what, what uh, Chicago public school students are, are dealing with on a daily basis, uh, like extreme levels of violence uh, and gang violence in the city. Um, and so they, they, it's, it's a really, Highly unequal and highly, uh, really rough system for all, for CPS students. And in this document, the schools that Chicago's children serve, which is something that I think uh, folks here might be interested in checking out, um, they put forward this vision about you know school um, you know, children in CPS being able to have uh, you know arts and music classes. Right now, only 25% of CPS students or of CPS schools have arts and music teachers, which is mind-blowing to me as someone who, like, I went to a kind of crappy public school in Michigan, but I always took it for granted I would have an arts and music teacher, right? Um, libraries for our, all schools, and there's 160 schools out of the 600 some in Chicago that don't have libraries. Again, something that most people, I think, don't come up in these urban school districts, take for granted that your school would have, would have a library. Um, what, what folks call wraparound services that uh, there are no there's like 202 nurses throughout the entire Chicago public school system when, uh, you know, according to um, sort of independent analyses of both sort of nurse to student ratios, there should probably be sort of like 684 nurses uh, in, in Chicago public schools, uh, but instead there's a third of them. Okay. Social workers, um, same story. So, you know, they, they put forward this vision of what what the what education reform should look like. It's a, it's a longer document that goes into lots of details about all the different, um, all kinds of different you know, reforms that they think should be happening. Which again is something that lots of teacher unions have not done and don't do. Um, and that document became sort of the basis for this strike that they went on, which folks probably heard about uh, in September. 
strike became the means by which uh, they were going to be fighting for that uh, agenda of a kind of progressive um, education reform. And, and, the, and the, in, in going on strike, they were fighting for the things uh, that were in that document that were, um, that, that, that no one else, I should say, is talking about. That, that the, the people who are pushing this kind of neoliberal education reform are not talking about arts and music classes for every single uh, CPS student, uh, libraries, or there's no plan to make those things happen. The teachers union was the one who um, made the, made the habit really fought for that um, through things like uh, the strike. Um, probably going over time here, so I can wrap up. Because um, there's lots more to talk about with the strike, and you know, there's this huge school closure fight in Chicago. Um, but I, the central point that I, I guess I'm trying to make uh, with this book I'm writing about the CTU and, and, sort of in, and talking about them in general is that you know, the teachers unions have been seen, again, as a sort of, as preventing education reform um, from happening across the country in, in schools that are admittedly in really rough shape, like schools that are lacking these very, very basic resources that, both, that lots of other school districts really take for granted. Um, and these, these education reformers, these neoliberal education reformers, would like to blame teachers' unions uh, for the sorry shape of these schools. Um, but the Chicago Teachers Union has really shown uh, that teachers' unions can be uh, a, a means by which teachers fight for those things for students. Uh, and so, and in, in fighting for their students, they're also fighting back against this agenda that has really exacerbated inequality um, for you know, public school students around the country. So, I can stop there. I think folks want to talk about it. It's a, lar it's a very large topic. I skipped over a large thing. So I'll talk about it. I've gone over time, but um, if anyone has, anyone has any thoughts or questions, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about Karen Lewis and, you know, what was it about her personality that, I guess, allowed her to assert the leadership of the union and reasons for her success, I mean, is there your personal qualities about her that, you know, may be unique or may be different? So Karen Lewis is the president of the teachers union. Folks might have seen her on TV. Um, she was a, uh, I forget how long she was classroom, like 22 years, maybe even 30 years as a chemistry teacher, um, and never had any real, the way she tells the story, which I, which I believe, that she never had any aspirations to become the president of the union, uh, was something she thought she would do. She was actually planning on retiring uh, before she ran for president, but was convinced that she should. That she should. And I, the way that uh, the fight in Chicago is often portrayed is sort of like, Karen Lewis with this huge personality uh, versus Rahm Emanuel, the mayor, with this also huge personality. This sort of like foul mouth mayor who doesn't take any crap with this like, you know, uh, equally sort of, well, not quite as foul mouth, but sort of fighting woman who's not going to take any crap from the mayor, right? Um, and there's certainly some truth to that, and, and it's, it's been interesting to see how people have really sort of, like whenever Karen speaks in public, people start chanting like Karen for mayor. Um, <laughs> Funny to see, um, but I think the bigger the bigger reason for the CTU's success has been that they have actually it's like a lot more of a boring thing actually they just transformed the union and made it much more democratic and made the members themselves take on much more power in the union so that when you when you see you know uh, media ask Karen Lewis you know well are you going to do X thing as a union and she'll say well we'll have to, I have to take it to the members and talk to the members about whether or not that's something that they would uh, want to do. This is not the way that unionism almost anywhere is done, it's certainly in, in lots of teachers, um, but in, in any kind of union. Um, you know, there's this sort of person who's on top and sort of calls the shots and tries to get their members in line behind just things they want to do. Um, so, you know, while, the, while Karen Lewis is a very fascinating uh, public personality, um, I think the, the bigger reason that the CTU has become the sort of dynamic national force that it is, is because the union.
grassroots, bottom-up uh, organizing.